So what I'm going to be presenting today is a hands-on tutorial. Um, and so to get started on this hands-on, I'm going to start right from the agenda page. And I'm going to go right uh, to the notebook that is linked on my presentation and sign in. Now, of course, I'm already signed in to University of Nebraska. This is not my first time testing this today. And, um, and uh, once you get in, uh, you'll select the first option, HD Condor Week 2022 Site Tokens Tutorial. And this will start up a notebook for you uh, running on OS Pool resources. Now this will take a few seconds. I think usually it takes around 10 to 20 seconds. Um, usually not too bad. But of course, if we're all doing it at the same time, I'm sure it will slow. And this is the hands-on today. It's all within this Jupyter Notebook. Now, you could go through this Jupyter Notebook and execute every line. You could be done in 10 seconds easily. But if you actually, uh, I'm going to go through, I'm going to describe each command. I'm going to describe what's going on. And, uh, and there's text also surrounding these commands, also doing the same, describing what's going on. And so for the hands-on, if you want to complete the entire hands-on today, you will need to have a GitHub account. Um, and that's it. Uh, everything else will be done in this uh, web interface. So today we're going to be creating a, a site token signing key. We're going to publish the key to create a virtual issuer. But, but before we get too far, is there a way to make the, the, the font bigger? Just uh, slightly too small to, to see for us folks in the back who need glasses. Uh, one more. Gotcha. Perfect, thank you. There we go, is that a little better? Okay. First, we'll be creating a site token signing key. Publish that key to a website to create a virtual site token issuer. And then we'll use that token to submit to HD Condor node. All right, so first steps first, we need to create keys. A uh, key is used to sign a site token to validate that it was uh, that it was authorized and that this key actually represents what the issuer wanted. And so, in order to create a key, there's a tool called Site Tokens Admin Create Key. There's a couple of options you need to do. You need to tell it to create keys in the PEM format, and that we're first we're creating a private key. And uh, what this command does is it just forwards it to a file. Now, if we take a look at this private key, this might look familiar to some system admins around here. This just looks like a regular RSA uh, key that you might get when you're trying to create an SSL certificate. But uh, side tokens, uh, even though they do use keys in the PEM format, when you post it to the web, they want it in a format called JWKS, JSON Web Key Signature. And so it's another RFC out there. And uh, in order to tell, there's an, uh, the same tool, but what you do is you tell it to read in a private key and to spit out a JWKS public key. And then it spits out this JSON. And this JSON describes the public components of that private key you just created, right? Because in this uh, system, there's private keys and there's public keys. And so this is a representation of the public component of that private key. Has a lot of out attributes here that we won't really go over, other than the algorithm that's used for this uh, key is the RSA uh, SHA-256. Uh, um, a few things about it, uh, and the key type is RSA, and then the key ID, uh, which is used to identify it when you have multiple keys. So now this text blob, and I'll describe it as well, what we need to create an issuer is the only key we need is that public key we just created. But now we need to post it somewhere. All side tokens clients reach out somewhere and grab the public key from the web. And so we need to put this public key on the web. It needs to be in a certain format and it needs to be uh, uh, findable by the client in a well-known uh, uh, structure. So we're gonna create a configuration file by going to this repo website, and I have a link and I'll go through it as well. We'll create a new file. 
with our username, our GitHub username, and then a slash, and then well known, and then a slash, then open ID configuration. And I'll show you, I'll do this along with you. So we'll go to this repo. This is a re special repo that we set up for this uh, presentation. We're going to create a new file. And in this, I'm going to do my GitHub username, djw8605, then a slash, which means create a new directory, then dot well known. And this well known directory is in the RFC. Uh, and that's uh, why we are using it. It's not something arbitrary we're making up. Well, I mean, somebody made it up, but it, now it's standard. And then all, this file name is also in the RFC. Open ID configuration. Okay, now the contents of the file, we get the contents from here. So we can just go ahead and copy and paste it. We'll have to edit it because it has a uh, username in it that we need to replace. So this is the metadata. Oh, sorry. Tabs and tabs. This is the metadata that the client will see. Let me increase the font size of this as well. This is the metadata that the client will see uh, when it first tries to download uh, the public key components. So it will always go to this issuer in this very well-known directory, dot well-known slash open ID configuration. The issuer is more metadata than anything else. It's not really used by side tokens, but we put it. And then the JWKS URI, this is where the client should look for the uh, public key component. And that's what we're gonna upload next. But for right now, we're just gonna put our username, replace the username with our username in this OAuth2 keys uh, directory. Okay, we're done with this file. We've made our necessary changes. We changed the usernames. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new branch, propose the change, and then create a pull request with this. Now I've got Brian over there who's gonna be accepting all these pull requests just as fast as he can, but we're not quite done yet. There's one more file. If you if we go back to the notebook, there's a step two. We've gotta get those public keys, the public key components that we created earlier. We've gotta get that on the web. So this once again, this is the same thing. We just need to add a file. So if we click on my branch right here, it says DJW batch, patch one. And uh, very similar flow, create new file. We'll do it again in my directory, DJW8605, and then OAuth2. And again, this directory, uh, this directory is more made up. You can put it in any directory you want, but uh, it has to be pointed to by that uh, open ID configuration file that we just added in the first step, keys. Now the contents of this, all it is is the public components that we create up here. So you just copy and paste. And that's that file. No need, nothing to change here. No usernames in this file at all. So I'm just gonna leave it, commit it directly to my patch. And then I see there's a, a lot of other pack pull requests going on. That's great. And here's my pull request and I'll have uh, uh, Brian accept them as fast as he can. Okay. Now uh, GitHub takes a little bit between when the pull request is accepted and when it's actually published on the web. Uh, so it may actually take some time. I have some curl commands right here that you can test it, but I'm not guaranteeing that it will actually work yet. Uh, it takes, uh, yeah, this is the GitHub 404. It takes uh, on the order of a minute or so from between the when what the pull request was accepted and to when it'll actually be on the web. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next step and we'll come back to it here in a moment. As I scroll past this very long 404, okay. Now let's create our first token. Now we've only created the private and public keys to sign a token. We haven't actually created a token yet. But now this is the command that we're gonna to use to create a token. 
And remember, tokens are signed by the private key. So we have to give it this private.pem to sign the token. The key ID, uh, you'll notice up here in our, in the public components, there was a KID that uh, stands for key ID. So this is a very important number. If you have multiple keys in the same file, you have to tell it which one to actually test, or which one to use uh, to validate your side token. So I'm just gonna copy that real quick and then go down past 404 and replace it there. The issuer, now this issuer is where is the client gonna uh, look up the public keys for this, for this token. So remember we put everything under my, or under your own username directory. So I'm just gonna replace the username there. And what I'm gonna do is uh, after that, it's all just attributes you can add to the token. Uh, so you can add any attributes you want, uh, but side tokens, the clients that are actually gonna read and, and check your token are only gonna look for uh, specific ones. Um, and so one of the specific ones that uh, attributes that are tested on a side token is called scope. Now this is uh, a very loose token. Uh, it can read anything under the uh, root directory and it can write anything under the root directory. So I would not recommend making this token very often, but it's a good illustrative example. And uh, when you run this command, it'll all put this, I mean, it's letters, but it's not readable. Uh, and so uh, there's many online parsers for JWTs. One of my favorites is uh, demo.sidetokens or there's JWT. I'm gonna use demo.sidetokens just because I like it and I wrote it. Um, and this will, uh, if you paste your encoded version over on the right, it'll sp spit out the decoded version on the left. And so the token we created, you'll notice that it had that KID that I copied and pasted. It's using the algorithm to, uh, RS-256 and it has the scopes uh, that I added at the end of that command. Uh, it also adds uh, things that I did not specify. Um, it adds the issuer, uh, which I did, and then it has the expiration issued at date and not before. And so the expiration, by default, uh, that command will add an expiration of, I think, 20 minutes. Uh, uh, you can, of course, increase that, decrease that, whatever you want. Um, it has the issued at, uh, which, and all these numbers are not really, or all these dates are not really human readable. This is all Unix epic, epics times. Um, and so, uh, in order to actually understand what the date is, you probably have to put that yet into another parser if you want it human readable. Um, but yeah, so we have expiration, issued at, and then not before. And the issued at is usually uh, the same as the not before. And then we have this uh, JTI, uh, JSON token ID. It's just a unique identifier uh, for this token itself that can be used in logging and auditing purposes. Okay, now if Brian was fast enough on the merge request, let's go back up and check that our uh, OpenID configuration has actually been, uh, it's on the web. Yep, I can curl this uh, URL. Remember it was under the dot well known directory and then in this file OpenID configuration, it gives me this. And then if I look at uh, the keys, it should be the public key. There we go. Okay. Now we've created private and public components. We've created an issuer by putting the public component on the website. And we've created our first token. Now let's actually do something useful and use a token to talk to Condor. So first, if we just issue a Condor queue and the way that these notebooks are set up, it'll automatically talk to one of our queues. It should fail. We're not authenticating with anything. We don't have any tokens, uh, we don't have Condor talking with tokens yet. We haven't told Condor to use tokens yet. So let's create our first token that will allow us to talk to Condor. So there's a few things we need to change in here. And it says it right here. We need to change the username and the key ID. So let's change the username to our GitHub username. Let's change the key ID Let's, oh, that's not the key ID. Uh, so we had as part of the public key, remember it's this KID, it's this 
four character long uh, key ID. So we'll go ahead and put it there. I'm gonna go ahead and add my username to the sub. Now you notice the scopes are a little bit different over on the right. They're not the uh, ones that I had before. They're not read uh, colon slash or write colon slash. Condor has a little bit of different uh, scopes that are required in order to read and write information from it. Um, and those scopes are called Condor read and Condor write. Uh, there's also additional scopes, but these are kind of like the top level uh, scopes that are available. And so what I'm doing in this command is I'm just forwarding this output to a file named token. Now, we have, now that we've created that file, that token file exists, we have to tell Condor where to look for it. So we do that by setting an environment variable, bare token file, and then uh, the full path to the token. Now, if our SCED D is set up right, we should be able to do Condor Q and we can see jobs running. Or I think most of them are idle right now, but you see jobs. So what did we do? We, uh, at first, the Condor Q didn't work because we weren't authenticating in any way. But then we created a token uh, that listed our issuer. We told Condor where to find that token. And then we used uh, Condor Q to view the keys. Now, what did Condor do? I think it's is much cooler. Condor got the token from the, with the Condor Q command. The server received the, the token. It said, I don't know anything about this issue of DJW8605. What is that? And then it went out to GitHub and pulled down that URL. First pulled down the OpenID configuration file and it read the two lines and it said, okay, I look at keys this, uh, at this URL. It went back, it grabbed the public key. It took the token and made sure that the signature on the token matched the public key. It did all that behind our back almost instantly that we, uh, as you saw, I ran Condor Q and it instantly came up. But it was doing all that in the background. So we have tokens that are short-lived. We have public keys on the web that uh, Condor is able to just pull down and immediately authenticate us and then give us the access we needed in order to look at the job queue. Oh, and please, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask them at any point. Uh, of course. Go ahead, Brian. It's always good to have a point. Yep. Uh, so so you, you mentioned uh, two things. One is uh, the verifying the token is real. And, yep. and then you also mentioned a, a couple uh, of the scopes. Mm -hmm. can, could you go through kind of what Condor is looking at for the, the latter? What, what, what is it looking at in the scopes? Um, before it decides whether or not to uh, authenticate the, the session. And of course, Brian would probably be the best resource on this since he wrote that part. Um, so uh, what it's looking at is Condor has a list of scopes uh, that are defined in it that uh, every action has a, a privilege level that's required to perform that action. So uh, in order to look at the list of jobs, uh, I don't need write access to look at the list of jobs. I only need read. And so Condor read is the scope that's giving me that. But if, and then this is the exact next step, if I were to submit a job, then yes, I would need write access. I need to write to the Condor queue. And therefore that's the, the write scope that I added. Uh, yeah, right here. The write scope is, is adding uh, the ability to write to the queue. So if I submit a job and we're using the spool option here because this is a remote system that we're talking to with uh, tokens. Uh, we're not, this, this SCED D is not running on the same, same uh, notebook server that your notebook is running on. It's running on some remote server that you're using side tokens. So you submit the job and we get this uh, lovely job ID. And if we do Condor Q, we can see our job. Let's see, what, 4629. 4629 is the last one, and it's still idle. It may take a little bit for uh, Condor to schedule the job and have it run. Um, so we'll come back to it. Uh, and when we do, we'll use this Condor transfer data and then the job ID to grab the, all the output data, all output sandbox, including we'll cat the log. 
Okay, so what have we done so far? We've created an issuer with public and private key pairs. We've created a token. We've created a useful token that we've uh, used to talk to a Condor instance. Now let's uh, let's get a token from not our own issuer, from another issuer, from someone that uh, uh, an issuer that uses actual like authentication. You saw how we were just running commands on the command line. Uh, as long as we have access to that private key, we can make all the tokens we want. But what if we talk to an issuer that's much more controlled, much more shut down, uh, that you have to authenticate with them in order to get a token out of them? So that's what we're going to do here. Now, this one gets a little bit, uh, uh, you kind of have to jump back and forth for this one. Uh, so there's one command that you need to run in the terminal in the, in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and that is this. So we're going to use a, a, a service called OIDC agent to actually acquire the token and have us go through the OWA uh, workflow. So in order to open a terminal here in Jupyter Notebook, you go file, new, and then terminal. And there's just one command you need to run. And I'm just going to copy and paste it. So what this is doing, it's uh, if you've ever used SSH agent, yeah, the text is a little small for that. Uh, this is very similar. First, you set up your SSH agent, uh, and that's the eval part. And then the OIDC gen is, is you're generating the configuration for this issuer. Oh, and I've already done this, so I'm going to change one thing here. OK. It's going to ask what scopes you want, and I'm just going to—I want the max. Give me everything that this issuer allows me to get. So I just hit enter, and it gives me OIDC agent prints out this nice QR code that is giant on terminals, but it also uh, gives me a URL, and so I'm just going to do the URL. So if you—if you've ever logged in uh, to, for example, HBO Max on your Fire TV or on your TV. This is a very similar flow. You get a URL, go to HBO Max TV sign in on your phone, then you have to log in there, and then instantly it just works on your uh, TV. This is very similar. So here's the URL I need to go to. So go to that URL. It gave me a user code, just like a HBO Max always gives you that eight digit code or whatever. If I go type it in, it's going to have me go through the uh, identity provider, and you can use your institution or you can use GitHub, whichever one you want. And I'm going to use GitHub in this case. Now, I've already authorized GitHub to allow this issuer, but you'll probably have to go through and say, yes, GitHub, I trust this person with, I think it's only asking for your email, uh, with your email, and, and then you're good. Now, if we go back to the terminal, you'll notice at the bottom this new prompt came up enter encryption password for my account. Uh, I do not want an encryption password. This is not the safest way to do it, but that's okay. And that's it. Everything is set up correctly. So what you just did there is you did a whole OAuth flow. You went, you start off on your terminal, you went to the browser and authenticated yourself with GitHub, and then the issuer, and then you went back to the issuer, and the issuer said, okay, uh, GitHub, sure, I know Derek, uh, go ahead and uh, issue him a token. So now in the Jupyter Notebook, we're going to, uh, yeah, we're jumping back to the Jupyter Notebook now. We're going to do the same eval so that we can use the tokens in the notebook. And if we do the OIDC token command, we've got a token. Now this token, and I'm going to go back to my favorite uh, token parser. All right, copy, paste. This one looks a lot different than the previous token. It's a lot longer. So this issuer adds stuff <coughs> that uh, the other issuer did not. Uh, you'll see that the key, KID, key ID is different. Uh, you'll notice that it has, a, uh, and I don't have a laser pointer, but that's all right. Uh, it has a uh, audience this time, has a subject, uh, and uh, this particular subject uh, identifies me. I mean, it's not really human readable, but uh, it's unique for me. Uh, version of the token uh, has the stuff that we've already seen before, scope, issuer, expiration, issue that, 
uh, and then various other attributes that the, this, these are all attributes that the issuer adds. But you'll notice that it still has that scope, condor read, condor write. And that's the important bit. So now if we overwrite our previously made token with this new one, we're just overwriting the token file that we used previously. If we do a condor queue, all the jobs are still there. And you'll notice that some of them are actually running. Now, does anybody remember which job ID was mine when I submitted? 4629. Okay, 4629 is completed. So now I can do the transfer job. And I can catalog. And so now we can see that the job ran. Let's see if we can actually tell where it ran. No, I don't see anything useful. And you also notice if you look at the file browser, uh, you can see the standard out, standard error, the log, and everything along with that. Okay. I know I went a little fast, and I apologize. So what did we all do? We create our own issuer with our own private and public keys. We uh, made a token, we made a useful token that uh, went out to Condor and grabbed information, uh, saw the job queue. We submitted a job with that token. Then we went out to a production issuer. Uh, we saw how that flow works. And we also were able to use that token to check on our job and then actually retrieve the results from our previously submitted job. All right, are there any questions? Are there any questions online? That means I gave a perfect tutorial. Nothing went wrong, so that's shockingly good. Yep. So Derek, for those of us who are not as steeped in token lore as yourself, yep. um, can you just give a quick, what's, what's where? I'm running this notebook on a server and yep. I'm, what am I interacting with? Yep. And what does it know about? I wish I had a whiteboard right here. That I could... um, so you're running only your Condor queue or whatever on this notebook. The SCED-D, the servers, are all uh, hosted, I think, somewhere in Kubernetes land in the CHTC. So it's all, all your commands are going to be remote, Condor queue, all the things. So Condor queue will grab the token and use it to authenticate with that remote server. So it, it will send that token uh, uh, securely over to the server. For verification. So, so Christine, if I if I can add one or two things to the answer, um, site tokens um, is kind of an external method that you have to uh, have something outside Condor that bootstraps the, the trust. Uh, so the, the way that this is done is exactly what you saw through, through GitHub, that there's, uh, it, it knows, or Condor knows how to look at the token and say, hey, this claims to be issued by uh, sitetokens.org slash Christina. Uh, so I am going to go ask sitetokens.org slash Christina who, you know, what are the public keys that are real and permitted for the site? So it uh, that that was the whole piece that we did with with GitHub here is went through the process of how do you create and publish signing keys that allow you to it be a, a root a, a trust root, and uh, that allows you to, to really be able to, to validate uh, the, the tokens and say is this real versus is this fake. Uh, the 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 last part that is also kind of an important one, and, and so again to re reprise, you have your your client and your remote access point, and that central, you know, public web server is that third party saying, "Here's how you verify the, the particular token." And, and then the other aspect here that Derek was showing was the uh, the fact that 
it's pretty rare for these sorts of tokens to actually have direct access to the private key, right? So that with the private key, you know, it's like being root on the cluster. You can create anything you want. You can publish anything. You you can do anything. You know, anybody who has a private key wins. Um, so the more common way to distribute tokens, and uh, this is done every day in the browser because this is how Google and GitHub and uh, and folks work, is through this particular workflow called OAuth. And so you you might have seen OAuth or OADC kind of buzzwords jargon around Condor for the last couple of years. So in this particular case, it's an example of using this OAuth service in order to actually generate the token instead of using the all powerful signing key in the browser or in the, the Jupyter Hub to, to sign the token. So that the OAuth is kind of what you see at the big sites, they, or the, the bigger setups, the more complex setups, because the more you distribute that public key, the, uh, the more security concerns you might have. 